On the fateful evening of the 27th of June 1850, Queen Victoria encountered a perilous brush with mortality. Accompanied by her children, she ventured to visit her ailing uncle at his opulent residence on Piccadilly. A throng of eager Londoners had gathered outside, eagerly anticipating a glimpse of the monarch. Amidst this gathering, one man harbored a different intent. Seizing the moment as the royal entourage departed, Robert Pate forcefully advanced through the crowd, swiftly closing in on the Queen's open-top carriage, and delivered a malicious blow upon her head with a metal-tipped cane. Pandemonium ensued as the crowd erupted into panic. Yet, amidst this chaos, Victoria, it is said, stood unwavering, adjusting her bonnet, and composedly declared, I am not hurt. This marked the fifth assault upon her person since her ascension to the throne in 1837. Accounts from the media often underscored her poise and collected demeanor. The Morning Post reported that Her Majesty betrayed no feeling of alarm and exhibited complete self-possession, graciously acknowledging the cheering spectators as her carriage made its way back to Buckingham Palace. This portrayal of the Queen, as resilient, imperturbable, and resolute in her duty, resonated with the public perception of her then and now. Victoria's renowned quote, We are not amused, although possibly never spoken by her has come to epitomize the unflappability of the Queen and the prevailing mood of an era. The 19th century is often envisioned as a time of restrained emotions, while some celebrate its perceived stoicism. For a deeper exploration, read about the origins of the stiff upper lip. Dear viewers, Slant News TV is currently engaged in an ardent pursuit of achieving its inaugural milestone of 1,000 subscribers. We earnestly implore your wholehearted support by subscribing to our channel. Notwithstanding her public facade, Victoria's personal journals unveil her vulnerable and emotional side. Reflecting upon the attack from the sanctuary of Buckingham Palace, she confessed that it now seemed like a horrid dream. As she chronicled the incident, her initial fear and confusion gradually transformed into anger, perceiving the outrage as the most disgraceful and cowardly thing that has ever been done. Victoria was not the sole individual affected by this event. Prince Albert was dreadfully shocked, while Sir George Grey, the Home Secretary at the time, arrived at Buckingham Palace, greatly distressed and in tears. In the aftermath of the attack, Victoria remained shaken, nervous, and unable to eat. Nevertheless, she ventured to the opera, where exultant crowds jubilantly tossed their hats in the air and serenaded her with spontaneous renditions of God Save the Queen. Although not all Victorians were fervent supporters of the monarchy, such attacks on the Queen incited outpourings of genuine emotion. As Victoria herself quipped, it is worth being shot at to learn how much one is loved. Her determination to not retreat from the public eye in the face of these assaults was characteristic of Victoria's early years. In 1842, a teenage boy named John Francis aimed a pistol at her carriage as it traversed Constitution Hill. Alerted by Albert, Francis refrained from firing and managed to evade capture. Despite the potential threat posed by an assailant still at large, Prime Minister Robert Peel urged the Queen to remain at home while his newly established police force hunted for the attacker. Victoria adamantly refused. The following evening, she and Albert ventured out in their open-top carriage, guarded but still exposed. As anticipated, Francis made another attempt, this time succeeding in firing his pistol at the royal couple just moments before being apprehended by a policeman. Victoria emerged unscathed, but the outcome could have been tragically different. Following Francis' assault, the Queen promptly resumed her royal duties, steadfastly appearing in public, seemingly unscathed. This defiant and public display of courage by the Queen garnered widespread praise in the press. A poem published in the Times described her as a lion-hearted monarch and hailed her as a king in courage, though by sex a queen. It was crucial for Victoria to project strength and fortitude in the public eye. Some Victorians, including one of her subsequent attackers, harbored skepticism about living under what they derisively referred to as petticoat government, questioning the ability of women to possess the determination and composure necessary for effective rule. However, traumatic experiences such as these can leave lasting impressions that are not easily shaken off. By the time Robert Pate launched his attack in 1850, Victoria had begun to feel anxious in crowded settings, a common consequence of experiencing a traumatic event like being a victim of a violent crime. 
In her journal, she candidly admitted that when the public press too close to her carriage, it always makes me think more than usually of the possibility of an attempt being made on me. Yet, ultimately, the most profound emotional blows Victoria endured did not stem from assassins but from the deaths of those she held dear. Only a few days after Pate's attack, Robert Peel, a staunch ally of the Queen and a close friend of Albert, tragically perished after falling from his horse. Shortly thereafter, Victoria's uncle passed away. In her private journals, she confessed to being overwhelmed by a feeling of awe and sorrow. These events, however, paled in comparison to the profound grief that consumed Victoria when Albert died in 1861. For the subsequent decade, she withdrew from public life and sank into a profound state of depression. She described this period as one of violent grief, wherein her nightly longing for death never subsided. Though she lived for another four decades, she never fully recovered from the loss. Occasional attempts were made to coax her back into making public appearances, two of which resulted in further assassination attempts. However, these were marked by a diminished frequency and enthusiasm compared to her earlier years. The final phase of her life was marked by continued losses, chronic pain, and disability, as indicated by her journal entries that hint at additional episodes of depression. Victoria managed to survive seven assassination attempts, gave birth to nine children, and found a way to endure even after the loss of Albert. While her wealth and power shielded her from many of the hardships faced by less fortunate Victorians, she still keenly felt the impact of personal grief. Her public displays of bravery and self-control only present half of the story.